Amen. You guys can take a seat. Um, you guys doing good today? You're looking good. Well, my name is Mike. I'm the lead pastor here. Just excited, excited for this morning, excited for next week. We kicked off this brand new decade with a series called How to Start a Decade. And we've been taking a look at these questions that I ask myself, kind of my dashboard questions that are the gauges and the warning lights that help me know whether my life is headed in the right direction. And I'm excited for next week. Next week, I'm going to talk about the third question that we were supposed to talk about last week if the parking lot was plowed but it wasn't plowed so we didn't talk about that but I'm uh, I'm even more excited for this morning this morning we got a special treat Jody Weissman is here and she's gonna she's gonna share with us about this fourth dashboard question and if you have not met Jody yet you need to you need to meet her if you don't know what she looks like you will in about 20 seconds so just take, make a mental note meet Jody Jody's incredible she's got an incredible story just uh, a ball of energy and I'm fired up for what she has to say to us this morning about who God is and who he made all of us to be so would you guys put your hands together and give Jody a warm revision welcome oh, thanks buddy thanks Grant well good morning good morning good morning good morning so um, as you know, my name is now Jody Wiseman. I'm up here, and I am going to talk today about our uh, fourth question, which is finding purpose in our lives. So I thought it was kind of funny that um, kicking off a decade, we uh, kicked it off with P words. And so uh, our words were purpose, or, or I'm sorry, your, your posture. Our, is your posture one of humility and pride? What does your posture look like? The second week was who are your people? Who are you hanging out with? Last week, P for parking lot. That's all you missed, guys, okay? Fourth week, P, purpose. So today we're gonna talk about purpose. Where do you find your purpose? Uh, where, what drives you? Where does your happiness come from in that purpose? I'll never forget, it, it was just a hot second ago, I was in high school, and I was my senior year in high school, and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And I, the idea of going to a four-year college just did not excite me. I had to try really hard for my grades. And so one day on the announcements, they said that the American College of Hairstyling was coming in if somebody wanted to talk to them. And I thought, hey, that kind of, I think I might like that. So I went in and I talked to this woman. And I knew, I was like, yep, I'm a hairdresser. I'm a hairstylist. I'm a barber. I'm going to go to school for this. I'm going to go to trade school. I'm not going to go to the university. So excited. And I remember I had that excitement in me. I was so excited. And I go and tell my friends, I'm like, I'm going to barber school. And they looked at me and they're like, what? No, what, what are you talking about? And I was like, no, I'm so excited. And they're like, you're not going to go to Iowa or Iowa State or Drake? And I was like, no. And I remember these two girls made fun of me for that choice that I made. And then I doubted myself. And I thought, you know what? I'm going mm -mm, to show these girls, okay? So I went to barber school, I got done in 10 months, graduated top of my barber class, and then I thought, mm-hmm, I'm gonna show these girls. And then I thought, you know what? Okay, well now that I accomplished that, I mean, like, it feels good, but I thought that I would have gotten way more enjoyment out of it, and I thought, okay, now I'm a, next, I'm gonna build up my clientele, I'm an amazing clientele. So a couple years later, I get my clientele built up, and I'm like, okay, I'm good now, and I'm like, mm, still really not kind of feeling it. So I thought, okay, my five-year class reunion's coming up. And I cannot wait. I'm going to just go in. I'm going to boom, bust the doors down. I'm going to go up to those ladies. I'm going to let them know. Look at me. I got a fancy little car. I live on my own, making good money, successful, have clients. And you guys, I waited five years for that moment. I was so excited. Oh, so excited. Guess what? It never happened. I get to my five-year class reunion, and those two girls that made fun of me never even remembered that they made fun of me or that I chose to be a barber. So then my moment that I lived for five years for was totally taken away from me, and I was so mad. Oh, I was mad. So I was like, all right, well, I'm going to chase the next thing. And then God showed up in my life, and I decided that I had been chasing the wrong things. I had been chasing what the world would see as me being successful. And you know what? It led me to a dead end. I think so many times we base our self-worth, our self-purpose, on the accomplishments, on our accomplishments, on our bank account, on our status. Do we have our name on a door with some letters behind it? That's what the world says. But I realized that in doing that, that the world was my dead end. Because every time I'm like, okay, so I'm going to get this and be happy. And then I got that. And I was like, yeah, it's still a little flat. And I'm like, yep, now I'm going to do this. And every time I'm like, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. And God's like, girl, would you just stop and let me take over? 
So finally I realize I'm gonna let God take over, okay? So in that, I realized that the world was just dead end after dead end. And I started to realize that my purpose was God. And that once I realized my purpose and worth was important because I was a child of God. This world is gonna say a lot of things about us. You're not tall enough, you're not skinny enough, you're not pretty enough, you don't make enough money, you don't live in the biggest house, you don't drive the biggest car. But you know what God says? You are enough, you are enough, because you are my child, and I made you in my image. Therefore, guess what? God don't make no junk, he doesn't. I'm worth, amen, brother, amen. I'm worth something to God, and that's what gives me purpose. So as I started to have this new revelation of getting my worth from God and not from the world, um, I started, I just opened my Bible and started reading in Genesis because, you know, that's like the first book, right? And I didn't know what I was doing, so I was like, all right, let's see what happened. Okay, here we go. So, in the beginning, all right, okay, I got that much in the beginning. And then it struck me how God spoke everything into existence. So if you think about in the world before everything began, how dark it must have been. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And he created the mountains and the seas and the animals by his voice. And what a thundering voice that must be. And then, of course, he decided to make man in his image. And it said that he took the dust of the ground and that he formed man and then breathed life into his nostrils with his holy breath. And in reading that, it made me feel so important and cherished and know that I'm his prized possession. Like he took some dirt from the ground and gave me life. That's the same voice, the same breath, the same God that we worship today. And you know what that voice says? You are mine. And you are enough. So put your name in that. You are enough, Shauna. You are enough, Tiffany. You are enough, Jim. You are enough because we were created in his image and he literally breathed a holy breath upon us. We are enough. We need to not listen to what the world says. We need to listen to what the Bible says. Which is good, because when I realized this, I'm a confession state. Because So I used to take a lot of pride in being a trophy wife, you know. Well, the last three years, I've packed on about 30 pounds and had some stuff. So now I'm okay with just being a blue ribbon babe. I'm okay with that. I'm okay. And God says, good, Jody, because you're enough. Because there's just more to love now. That's fine. That's fine. But now I used to feel like I had to have a standard. I had to have a label. And God's like, no, Jody. Again, you are enough. So I know I got some blue ribbon babes in the room. That's fine. We're from the Iowa State Fair. Blue ribbon babes. We're good with that. I like that label. I don't feel like I have to live up to as much if I'm just like a blue ribbon babe as opposed to trophy wife. The status of that is just it was too much for me. It was tricky. So anyway, so again, knowing who we are, that we are children of God. I want to go to the first reading, which is um, from 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. It says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Let me read that again. You're God's special possession. If that doesn't make you feel important, I don't know what does. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into a wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You once had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I like in the message... Um, the Message Bible is just a different version. I, I feel like sometimes it makes things plain as day. And part of the message said of the first Peter, it said that we are God's instruments to do his work, to speak out for him and tell others of the night and day difference that's happened, that we went from nothing to something, rejected to accepted. So I need to stop right here, and we're going to just have a real quick Bible lesson. Okay, so that reading, because it says that we were called out of darkness, that we weren't his people, and now we are. So... OT versus NT, Old Testament, New Testament. So in Old Testament times, they had an ark, it was this thing was called the Ark of the Covenant, and inside was the Ten Commandments that Moses had, okay? So when the Israelites had fled Egypt and finally settled, the Ark of the Covenant, okay, had the, had the, um, the Ten Commandments. And then there was a curtain around it. So that was called the most holy place. Then there was another curtain around that 
called the holy place, okay? So in Old Testament times, once a year, the high priest would go in and offer a sin offering for us. Only him. Now, none of all y'all would have been there because, you know, we weren't the high priest, so we didn't get a go. We didn't get that access to the most holy place where the power of God was. We didn't have that. We had to have the priest go in for us. Now, so now we're going to fast forward. So that's how you had to do it in the Old Testament. Old Testament, we had to have the blood of an unblemished lamb to forgive us for our sins. Well, now we have Jesus, who is that perfect lamb and that perfect sacrifice. So now fast forward to the New Testament. As Christ is dying on the cross, wait for it, this is my favorite part, as he takes his last breath, the curtain around the most holy place tears in two and falls to the ground. To symbolize to us that we now have direct access to God. We don't have to go through a high priest. Jesus was the perfect lamb sacrifice for us. And now because of Jesus, we get direct access. We're no longer on the outside of the curtain. We're no longer not good enough. We are from, we are now redeemed. We are now accepted. And when that curtain torn, it gave us that direct access. So no more high priests. Jesus is the way. So now the deal is that we need to live our life knowing that we are his prized possession. To know that our identity comes from Christ who made you, not what the world says about you. Not that the world wants to, um, again, tell you that you're not enough, that you don't do enough. That's not what God says. You are my prized possession. And I pray that you know your identity comes from Christ who made you and breathed life into you and spoke you into existence. And that is how you live with purpose. So the second heading is purpose and our worship and the ability to love his people. So this is what I like talking about worship. So when you say worship, I think people think of like worship music, you know. Well, our worship is way more than just music. I wish, I can't play an instrument and sing, but oh gosh, I wish I could. So that's like, if you see me here, I'm usually like row one or two because I love to sing so much. I'm usually like hand up in the air. I'm kind of dancing a little bit, you know, and then I kind of feel like I'm like a backup singer with Grant a little bit, you know? So that's why I got to get real close. I always have to sit front row. So for me, that's some of my worship music. So your worship is also how you live. Are you giving thanksgiving to God? Are you loving others? Are you being gentle with others? And if you are, that is a form of your worship to your God to thank him for what he's done for you. Again, everybody's different. Everybody, everybody's worship looks a little different. And I remember one day somebody said to me, if you got put on trial today for being a Christian, would you be found guilty? And it really made me think that is there enough proof in my life of the way I love live, approach others with my posture, would I be found guilty for Christ? And it really made me think about my life and how I wanted to live because if I ever got put on trial, I hope that I would be found guilty. So for me, so um, for those who were here last time I talked, I had a little um, sign up that had a light bulb and a salt shaker on it because that was, I told my girlfriend, I was like, I just want to be a salt shaker. I just want to shake the salt. I want to be a salt shaker. So one day I said to her, um, I want to stink like Jesus. And she said, what did you just say to me? So she made me my shirt, okay? So now I'm going to explain this to you. I want to stink like Jesus. No disregard, because Jesus and God are amazing. However, 2 Corinthians 2.15, you know what it says? That we are, to God, the pleasing aroma of Christ. Are you giving off an aroma that is pleasing to the Lord and pleasing to others. I think about what I could tell you, I remember what the tree in my backyard smelled like when I was little. I remember what my grandparents' garage smelled like. I remember what their basement smelled like. Those are the smells that trigger. Is your stink such a holy stink that you're triggering people to ask about Jesus? So that's why I say I wanna stink like Jesus because that is a holy stink aroma and smell and I wear that t-shirt all the time and it's funny because people be like what does your shirt say I'm like stink like Jesus and they're like what does that even mean I'm like oh holy aroma it's Corinthians 215 you ever heard of it and they're like no but I like it and they walk away and I'm like see then again I was at the gas station spread a little Jesus a little humor a little love nobody got offended so that's why I love that term stink like Jesus because we are to be that holy aroma so when you walk by people like oh what are you wearing Jesus what I'm wearing. That's what you can say. 
I always love the look on people's faces when you say it, because sometimes they're like, okay, crazy. <laughs> and then other times people are like, amen, sister. I'm like, yep, this, he knows, he knows. Um, so that's what our worship needs to look like. So we are called to love God's people. Not an easy task, not an easy, because we are called to love the lovely and the unlovely. The ones that are lovely, oh, they're so easy to love. But the ones that are unlovely, again, y'all been to Walmart before, you know. It's not always easy. So these are the five things, five things that are going to help us love God's people. We're going to be humble, gentle, patient, understanding, and full of peace. So let's start with humility. Mike kicked this one off a couple weeks ago about what's your posture? Are you approaching people, your spouse, your family, your friends, your coworkers, your sisters? Are you approaching it of humility or are you approaching it with pride like you know everything? And I want you to know, I have eaten some humble pie before, and it tastes like a gym sock. So I'm just going to let you know right now, every day, every day, because I can really have not a good posture. So I, every day, say, Lord, remind me that you are holy and that I am not. Save me from myself, because I can really mess some things up. But again, if I start the day and give him the glory and say, Lord, I know you're holy, and remind me that I'm not, and where my posture, where I stand and what my posture should look like. And so it says in uh, James 4.10, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. So when you do humble yourself, when you do humble yourself before the Lord and before others, he lifts you up. Okay, the next one's gentleness. Now, I really like this one and I don't know if you guys know that we live in Iowa and it's a caucus state, okay? Uh, We've had some commercials and some debates here and this is what's so crazy. Everything I've seen, I have not seen one ounce of gentleness. Gentleness is such a foreign word these days that if if, and when you show people gentleness, they look at you like you're a foreign object, okay? Gentleness is so important. So I'm going to tell you this. I love this story. So uh, my daughter is in a rock and roll band. And uh, after a show, it was late October, and the band thought it would be a a good idea to go to a haunted house, okay? And I, you know, I don't hail Satan. I don't, I just paid a lot of money to get to watch my kids get scared. It's really fun. So we're standing in line and we're getting ready to go into the haunted house. And a man shows up with a blow horn and a sign that says John 3.16. Okay. So he is pacing outside saying stuff that I'm not going to repeat because it was very colorful, very colorful. And so the band mom that was with me says, what's that sign he's holding? I said, oh, it says John 3.16. And she's like, what is, what is that? And I said, well, that's a verse that says, so God so loved, yes, so loved the world, that he gave us his one and only son, that if we would believe in him, we would have eternal life with God and not die. And she's like, so that's a verse about love. I'm like, mm-hmm. And she looks over, she goes, man, I don't want to go to that guy's church. Because you know what? He was yelling at the crowd, the crowd was yelling. I'm like, you're getting nowhere. You cannot Bible beat people into heaven. You're not going to beat them in. You're going to love them in. You're going to stink like Jesus, and you're going to shake shake your salt shaker. And when you do that, they're going to want to know. And that's when you approach them with gentleness. And like I said, it's foreign. People don't do it anymore. Gentleness is so important. So Colossians 4, 5, and 6 says, Let your conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. The people who look like you, the people who don't look like you, the people that believe like you and the people that don't believe like you. Approach them with gentleness and then make sure that your conversation is seasoned with salt because salt makes people thirsty and they're going to want to know. Then you lead them to the well, which is Jesus. The next one is patience. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I pray for patience and I get impatient so I quit paying for patience anymore because patience is a very tricky word, okay? So when my kids were young, I went into a study called Breaking Free and I thought, okay, I need to break free from these things, so I let God know. Hey, God, Jody here, I'm going to start the study. These are a couple things I kind of need to work on, so, you know, you're more than welcome to come along for the ride. So, guess what? I started the study, and that's not what happened. So, God started showing me things that I needed to break free from. And one of the things was, I was he showed me so clearly that I was not being patient with my children. I had a six-year-old and a three-year-old, and boots and hats and gloves, and I can do it myself, mommy, and they're frustrating moments, right? And so in the study, she said, when you're going to lose your mind or maybe say something or lose your patience, just say Jesus. And so I started to, uh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And so I just, for weeks, kept, I'd be, can you, Jesus, just Jesus. 
And finally, my daughter looked up to me. She was like five or six, and she goes, Jeez, Ma, you say Jesus a lot. I was like, I do, baby, I do. But then again, in Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And I didn't want to give up because I didn't want my kids to know that I was being impatient with them or maybe say something to them that I would regret. But my daughter noticed that I was sure saying Jesus a lot. So I was so glad I didn't give up because glory was right around the corner. Understanding, another good word. Trust in the Lord, lean not on your own understanding, Proverbs 3, 5. Let me say that one again because I need to hear it too. Trust in the Lord and lean not in your own understanding. How many times do we go into work and we've already judged the situation or we've already looked at the person and judged them and they're like, oh, this isn't going to be good. I already know what's going to happen here. Well, I have a friend, my, my sweet friend Deb. She works at a clothing store a couple nights a month to give herself some fun money. So Deb's working late at work one night, and it's about five minutes to close, and this woman comes in with two huge bags of clothes to return. And of course, the coworker was like, oh, I have had a long day. I am not going to help her. I'm out. You need to do this. So my friend Deb was like, that's, that's fine. I, that's fine. I can do this. So the lady put the two large bags up and started doing the return, and she's like, you know, um, ma'am, was there anything wrong with the merchandise, or um, do you have any questions about it? And she's like, no, I just didn't know which outfit to bother to bury my mother in. And in that moment, Deb was able to approach her with gentleness and understanding that the other woman couldn't. And in that moment, I think about what that woman must have thought. Like she just was trying to, her mom just died, didn't know, and then she walks in and somebody who's gonna be super short and super mean to her because I don't wanna take the time to return your clothes. Had no empathy and understanding of somebody else. But in that moment, Deb got to be that person to her, maybe listen to her, love on her, smile to her, because she trusted in the Lord and did not lean on her own understanding. Last one is peacefulness. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as a member of one body you are called to peace and to be thankful, which is Colossians 3.15. So again, we live in a caucus state. There's been a lot of stuff going on. So this is a funny thing. I love God's sense of humor. He's such a funny guy. Can't wait to get there and talk to him about some things. He, uh, he thought it'd be super funny to give me two kids, polar opposite. I have a kid that's a Republican and a kid that's a Democrat. And so, so much Democrat that, you know, she works for a campaign and is very passionate about. So then I want you to know what my dinner table conversations are like. This one I have to pull out. Let's be peaceful. Let's be one members called together to be thankful. So I do have to say, it's quite funny sometimes to listen to my young teenage children get so passionate But at the same time, at the end of every conversation, they still love each other, they don't get crazy about it, and they know that they are not going to change each other's minds. But they still approach each other in love and gentleness. And I think that that's something that we can all learn from. So people, be humble, gentle, patient, understanding, and full of peace when you approach people. And as you approach them that way, you're definitely going to stink like Jesus. So number three, the last one, is are we chasing purpose or are we treating every moment that's given to us as a divine gift? Ephesians 4.1, it says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have been, the calling you have received. So are you living a life worthy of what you've been called to do? I know that I've been called to be a speaker, a mom, a wife, a barber, a friend, a believer, and in all those things, am I giving glory and honor to God? He calls us, and then he equips us. He's not going to call you to do something and then leave you hanging. It's not the kind of God we serve. He will call you, and he will equip you. And we are worthy of that calling because he loves us so much. He he loves us more than we can ever imagine. That's, I think, when I had my daughter, I understood, like, God's love a little bit for the first time because it always says he loves us so much. So then I have this beautiful child. Like, no way could anybody love this child more than me. And God says, "Hmm, guess what I do? It rocked me to understand, to try in my little finite human brain to understand what that love looks like. The key here is to have an eternal perspective, not a worldly perspective. Because again, by the world, we'll never measure up. We'll never be the right age, the right weight, to make the right money. We'll never measure up. But to know, to, to, to get the eternal perspective 
and not that of the world. I think the last couple months I've really been able to understand life as a divine gift. I think death will do that to you. And in the last couple months I've buried my father and then his mother, my granny Shani, okay? Um, and I was struck by, when I walked into my grandma's funeral, you know, they handed the little pamphlet, and there it was. All it said was 1939, a little dash, and then it said 2020. And I was like, it's so crazy that these two little numbers are going to define my granny's life. And it just made me think about how in society we're controlled by numbers. You can't get anything without a social security number. You want to know your driver's license number, you know, what car you drive in so we can find you. Where's your address? Where do you live? How much do you weigh? What's your salary? How tall are you? What's your age? What's your 401k look like? What's in your checking account? All those numbers describe us, but they don't define us. So now I think it's so important that as I looked at my granny's pamphlet, these two big numbers and what was in the middle was just a little dash. But I realized it was that little dash that defined her life. The numbers described the day she, the day she was born and the day she died. I'm going to tell you something about my granny. My granny Shani oozed joy. She seeped love. And the light of Christ shone in her so bright, she would, she would light up a room. And the stu- everybody knew that about her. My granny always sang and loved. I remember one time we went over. My granny lived in Wahoo, Nebraska. It's really a town, I swear, I swear. So we go to Wahoo, Nebraska, and there's my granny. She was in a, a nursing home, but you didn't call it the nursing home. She called it the facility because it sounds better. You know, I ain't in no old folks home. I'm like, Granny, you're about 90 years old. It's the facility. Okay, okay, Granny, it's a it's facility. Walk in, Granny's in a wheelchair. I think she had gout on her foot. She had uh, uh, pneumonia, something wrong with her eye, and like an infection on her hand or something. And I said, Granny, looking a little rough. How are you feeling? And she says, fantastic. No matter how Granny felt, she felt fantastic. Because she knew she was a child of God. Life would come and circumstances would stink. But she knew. She knew that that little dash of her life was so important. And that little dash meant so much to me. We, as we buried her, we're standing at her gravesite, And we break into song. And we start singing this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Because she would sing that or she would sing to us, you are my sunshine. She could light up a room because she let Christ live in her in a way that touched people's lives. If she would have been put on trial, she'd have definitely been found guilty. That's my granny's life. So I urge you to take, uh, take those moments, to take every moment, be present in the moment, and enjoy it, because they truly are a divine gift. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16 says, be careful how you live, not as an unwise person, but as a wise person, making the most of every single opportunity. Years ago, I used to volunteer at a nursing home, and there was a sweet lady named Madeline who um, I just loved so much. She, was, well, she always would tell me I was pretty and loved my earrings, so it was really easy to love Madeline. So I went to look for Madeline at lunchtime, and she wasn't in the lunchroom, and the nurse told me that Madeline's health had been failing, and so I went and found her room. And as I walked in, I was taken by that there was a picture in the room of a guy I went to high school with. And I said, Madeline, how do you know Jeremy? And she's like, oh, that's my grandson. I was like, oh, I mean, Jeremy got in some trouble. I mean, I didn't, Jeremy mostly, but not me, you know. So I just had, uh, my heart was, I loved Madeline. So over the next couple days, Madeline's life was coming to a close. And so I lived really close, and so I want, I kept going up to check on her. So one morning, I started to whiz by really quick, because my to-do list was this long. And at the last moment, I thought, you know, I'm just going to run in really quick, just really fast. I don't want to wait. I went in, and the uh, nurse had told me that she hadn't been coherent in, I think, like 20 hours or whatever. So I thought, I'm just going to kneel quick beside her bed and just say a prayer for her. And I knelt down, and I put my hand on her arm. And right as I did that, she opened her eyes, and she looked at me, and she says, I see him. And I said, Madeline, who is it that you see? And she says, it's Jonathan, and I just want to go with him. I said, okay. She closed her eyes, and I watched a piece that surpasses all understanding flow over her body and in that moment was so special to me and then moments later she passed. So days later I went to the funeral and I went up and I hugged my friend Jeremy and then I walked up to his mother and I said, Joanna, I have to tell you I was with Madeline and all I know is I saw a peace come over her like I've never seen and who was Jonathan? And she looked at me and a big tear came and she goes, that's my dad, he died 20 years ago. 
And I'm so glad that in that moment, instead of being wrapped up in the world and worrying about myself, that God tugged at my heart to go be with Madeline so that I could experience that one precious moment that has been a gift to me. So my prayer for you is that you will live a life knowing that you are a child of God. And in that gives you, gives you purpose and worth because he literally formed you from the dust of the ground and breathed holy breath into you to give you existence, to know that you are enough, to approach people, all people, in gentleness and understanding, to live each day as a gift given to you, to make that little dash count between your numbers, really make it count. And let numbers describe you, but not define you, because you are a child of God, and you are enough. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Lord, I thank you so much for every person here. I thank you that you breathe life into us, Lord, that you um, call us yours, that we are your prized possession. I pray that every person in this room leaves knowing that they are that prized possession, that they matter to you, and that they are enough. And they let numbers describe them, but not define them. In your sweet and most precious name, amen.